uh, thank you all for coming, first of all. And again, uh, definitely want to check the display in the museum that t correlates with this. One of, the, one of the neat things about that display is it was created in Indianapolis by the Indiana Historical Society, but Lake Maxicucky is mentioned on there, which I think gives you an idea of the kind of significance of Lake Maxicucky in that, you know, in, in this whole discussion. Um, <clears throat> I found this really fascinating to learn. It said that between 1880 and 1920, Indiana ranked second in the, in the entire United States in producing literature, great literature, best-selling literature, uh, you know, great literature. And we're not talking about light reading. Um, most literate people uh, could and did appreciate uh, you know, the, the, the writers we're talking about, but it's kind of hard to imagine the impact today in the world of internet and movies and you know, that kind of mass entertainment. Um, <clears throat> You know, as with a lot of facets of history, technology or lack thereof uh, kind of factored a lot into this trend. I mean, if you can try to imagine a time before all this electronic media, not that I'm saying it's all bad, uh, music, if you heard it, was live, played by musicians in parlors, like that lady. Um, uh, after they'd practiced for countless hours, I mean, imagine audiences by the thousands sitting to listen to a band concert in a park or a classical music concert. You know, that kind of attention and that kind of just, just focus, you know, you know, really focused attention. Uh, kind of gives you an idea of, of the reading, the reading appetite. I mean, if you could read, there was a little bit more meat that went into the reading. Now, you know, imagine Lake Max and Cucky, of course, back during this period. We're going back to the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, the railroad came here in 1884. Uh, roads were bad, of course, as we know. Uh, although some felt it was uh, worth taking the roads to this place. Uh, imagine a lot of you recognize this place. It's still standing. It's one of the oldest still standing structures in the county. This is the Allegheny House, it's on 18B Road. And uh, back in these days, it was, it was actually built circa 1855, and it was a popular fishing hotel in those days, um, pre-railroad. And apparently the fishermen would be called to lunch by the big bell that's still up on top there if you drive by. Here it is in 1910, although in the previous image it looked a little closer to what it, what it did. Uh, when one fisherman visited it by the name of Lou Wallace. Here's General Lou Wallace. He was born in 1827 in, uh, in Brookville, Indiana. He'd become a state senator in 1856 and eventually was a major general in the Civil War. He was credited with saving Washington, D.C. from the Confederates in 1864. And uh, in 1865, he was a military judge at Abe Lincoln's assassination trial in the court martial of Henry Wirtz, the commandant of uh, Andersonville Prison. So a pretty significant guy in America's history, not just Indiana's. And he had a, quite a beard as well, as you can see. Um, as his career progressed, he was also appointed by President Garfield to serve as United States Minister to Turkey. Uh, he, I could go on and on about him. So many of you were at our program a few years ago, strictly on Lou Wallace, so you know, you've heard a lot of that. But he died in 1905 in Crawfordsville, and of course his home and his study is a museum now in Crawfordsville. If you're ever passing through, it's a, it's a pretty neat place, and again, it ties a lot into Calder's history. But he's best known, of course, for his novel, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. It was published in 1880, and since then it's never been out of print, which is pretty amazing. And it was the best-selling novel, if you can imagine this, of the entire 19th century. Best-selling novel of the century. Uh, by 1900, it had been printed in 36 English language editions, translated into 20 other languages, including Braille. Uh, in 1912, Sears Roebuck published one million copies for 39 cents apiece, which again, in those days, pretty amazing. I mean, the world population was smaller then. Um, that was the largest single-year print edition in American history. Uh, it outsold every book except the Bible until Gone with the Wind came out, and then it re resurfaced in the 60s and went back to the top after, of course, the movie. Uh, most of us are familiar with Ben-Hur through the movie. Uh, just as an interesting little aside, William Wyler, the director of the, the, the 1959 version, also directed Tom Brown of Culver. That was, it may have been his directorial debut, but that was filmed here in Culver, of course, in 1932. Um, the 1959 ver film version starring Charlton Heston won a record 11 Academy Awards. It was the best-selling film, highest-grossing film, I should say, in 1960. Now, if you've ever tried to read Ben-Hur, it's, it's not what we today would call light reading. It's, you know, I'm, I, I have to confess I haven't read it cover to cover, but there are multi-page descriptions of you know, a building, that sort of thing. So it's, pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty meaty stuff in terms of just the, the sheer volume of it. So again, that gives you an idea of, of the audience, you know, the reading audience at that time. Well, what's not as well known nationally or internationally is how much uh, Lou Wallace loved Lake Max and Cucky. 
And of course, you've probably heard he wrote some of the early chapters of Ben-Hur in the Allegheny House. In fact, the current owner of the Allegheny House uh, can show you the, the alleged Ben-Hur room. And, you know, we, don't, we obviously don't have the video or anything of him writing it. Um, but uh, just a quote from an article that is actually in this, this you know, current edition. If you haven't gotten in the mail, you should, or you'll, you can pick a copy up of the Antiquarian Newsletter, which reprints a, 19, a wonderful 1905 article in the Chicago American newspaper. And this is a direct quote. The most beautiful place in the world, Lou Wallace pronounced it, referring to Lake Max and Cucky. And in an old tavern, which would have been the Allegheny, sitting back from the roadside and looking as if it had stepped out of an English novel, he wrote The Chariot Race and other chapters of Ben-Hur. So, you know, we have that in print. It isn't just hearsay. <laughs> a little closer to hearsay, according to an article in the Culver Citizen, that's in print too, <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Laura, Mrs. Laura Babcock, sister of one-time Allegheny house owner George Spangler, used to be called the Spangler House, uh, confirmed that Wallace wrote part of the book at the Allegheny and that her brother had a Mexican dollar the general had given her. He, had given her. Uh, he, was, he was also the, gov was he the governor of New Mexico. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it was a territory at the time. Thank you. See, there we go. Um, <laughs> and the success of, uh, of, of Ben-Hur may have helped inspire other Hoosier authors. We'll get to why, why that picture is there. Um, <laughs> the cultural climate of Indianapolis, where among others, German-American families like the Vonnegut's, which are there, there they are on the right, there's Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s father, Kurt, uh, Kurt Sr., the young, young lad there. Uh, the families like the Vonnegut's were striving to create a vibrant community of culture and arts down in Indianapolis. And I would say that that kind of thing, and what I'm about to say, probably really had a lot to do with the literary environment that, that Indiana you know, spawned in those days. Um, along with other Indianapolis families, like the Marmons. I think we have some Marmon descendants here. And there's a picture of one of them on the lake. Um, helped make La Lake Maxincucky a rustic, na uh, naturally beautiful locale for literature, arts, and creativity to flourish as well. Certainly they weren't the only ones, but I'm thinking of uh, uh, Mrs. Marmon, who really made a big effort to keep culture and arts at the forefront around here and in Indianapolis, among many other people in the lake. Um, so I had to throw that in. <laughs> That yeah, picture. Yeah. I have to say, that's my mom drinking out of that tin. I didn't know if you wanted me to say that, but yes, that's, that's, uh, that's Ann Greenleaf there on, on the lake. That's great. She's either going to kill me or, or thank me for putting that in there. Okay. <laughs> um, Ten years after Ben Hur was published in August of 1890, a 21-year-old writer named Booth Tarkington visited Lake Max and Cucky. Uh, we know for a fact he met uh, young Gen Gen hmm, I thought it was Genevieve, it's Genevieve Reynolds. They played tennis here at the lake and argued about Elizabeth Browning and George Meredith. So they're talking literature. Tarkington grew rather attached to the young lady. And by that time, actually that year, he had published The Gentleman from, no, I'm sorry, he had already published The Gentleman from Indiana, which uh, was his first big hit novel. That book really established Tarkington as a writer. This is a that period photo uh, taken on, on the lake, I mean near the lake, uh, though his greatest success was still to come. It's been recorded in several published sources that uh, he put the finishing touches on the gentleman from Indiana while staying at a fishing cottage on the east shore of the lake. Uh, we have tangible evidence of that remaining in the form of his signature adorning the wall of what became a private residence. It was a, a rooming house at the time. Um, it was the Jameson and Judah Cottage in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and for some decades, starting in the 70s, it was better known as the Teague or Schaub House, and currently it's the Gibson Cottage on East Shore Drive. So, if that name sounds familiar, we just mentioned Jenny Gibson a few minutes ago who's joining our board. So that, and that, to me, that's just amazing and, and awesome that we have that signature right here on the lake of Tarkington, one of the great literary figures of America at that time, so neat stuff. Uh, again, hard to grasp the magnitude of Tarkington's name at the time. You know, I mean, he's not a household name today, of course. But as his career grew, uh, the magnificent Ambersons, that was his big hit, and you see over there on the left the movie poster, uh, that was published in 1918. It won the Pulitzer Prize in 1919, just to give you an idea. Uh, in 1941, Orson Welles uh, made the film version, and of course, hopefully we all know Orson Welles was a huge radio star. Uh, uh, he was an actor, he was a director, Citizen Kane was his, you know, was, was sort of his magnum opus, but The Magnificent Ambersons is still considered by a lot of critics to be just a fantastic movie that, that you know, Wells was a part of. 
This is a great letter. Uh, I believe this, this came from, this was loaned to us by Ted Schenberg. Um, it's July 29, 1890. Uh, this is a letter written by uh, James Whitcomb Riley. You can see at the bottom, J.W. Riley. And he's writing to a friend, R.E. Jones, and he's, I'll just sum it up. He's basically, uh, he's kind of correcting or, or, or tweaking up some poetry she wrote. And then he goes on to, to uh, print some of his uh, recent poem he just wrote. It's, now, we're going to talk about James Whitcomb Riley in a second, and we'll talk about that poem in a second. But it's interesting because he says, Should you write me, your letter would find me care Booth Tarkington, Maxim Cucky, Indiana. And this is a, and there's a little close-up of that. So, not only do we have James Whitcomb Riley on the lake, but he's hanging out with Booth Tarkington. <laughs> and, uh, you know, right here on Lake Maxinkucky. Like that siren. Um, so, yeah, James Whitcomb Riley, this is him on the right. And you see with the glasses. He was born in 1849 near Indianapolis. He was a friend of Booth Tarkington, he, uh, as well as Meredith Nicholson, who's sitting next to him. We'll get back to Meredith Nicholson, Nicholson in a few minutes. Um, House of a Thousand Candles, if you don't know the name, we'll get to him. And a number of the other Golden Age Indian authors. Uh, he, was, he was the Hoosier poet. So again, we can't overestimate what a huge name he was in this period in, in the whole United States, certainly in Indiana. Uh, he was also nicknamed the National Poet, the Children's Poet. This is interesting. He toured in the 1880s with Mark Twain, toured around, and was called upon to read his poems by the president and others at national civic events. So big name. Of course, one of his claims to fame, even though uh, she wouldn't really attain real fame till after uh, uh, Riley died in 1916, was this girl, Little Orphan Annie. He wrote the poem called Little Orphan Annie. It doesn't go into the Daddy Warbucks thing. It's, it's totally, if you know the poem, it's, you know, the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. Uh, but it did inspire the comic strip, which was hugely popular, Harold Gray's comic strip, and of course the play and the movie, and we all know Annie. Um, the letter that, that, again, that we saw earlier is pretty significant, uh, not only because we see him hanging around with Tarkington at Lake Maxinkucky, but also it shows an early version of this poem. This poem, that's popularly known as The Green Below and the Blue Above, it's a poem about Lake Maxinkucky, which is kind of neat. And I, I put some of the text up there. The green below and the blue above, the waves caressing the shores they love, sails in haven and sails afar, and faint as the water lilies are, and inlets haunted of willow wands, listless rowers and trailing hands with uh, spray to gem them and tan to glove, the green below and the blue above. The blue above and the green below, would that the world was always so, always summer and warmth of light, with mirth and melody, day and night, and it goes on and on, but I thought that was a nice, nice excerpt. So very cool that here's Riley writing a poem about our lake here. But of all the Golden Age authors, none so overtly kind of wed his writing with Lake Max and Cucky as this one. This is Meredith Nicholson. Uh, born 1866, died in 1947. He was one of the longest lived of these Golden Age writers. Um, and I'll start out by saying that uh, if I get anything wrong, the guy to ask back is Creighton Hippenhammer back here, who currently owns the House of a Thousand Candles, and wrote an article, was it 2008 when it was published? In 2008 in Traces Magazine, which is the uh, Indiana Historical Society's beautiful, slick magazine. So Creighton is, is much more the expert on Meredith Nicholson than I am, but uh, Meredith Nicholson was born in Crawfordsville to a Civil War veteran and a nurse. Uh, he studied law in Indiana, um, began writing, became a, a member of the Indianapolis News Editorial Board. Uh, he also served as a diplomat from the U.S. To, Ni to Nicaragua, Paraguay, Venezuela, until his retirement in Indianapolis. I mean, I'm jumping around in his life. But, uh, however, of course, during his years as an author, he won the most fame. Uh, he, he, he was all over the map in, in terms of how he wrote. He didn't just write novels. Uh, he wrote... Uh, political material, environmental concerns, all sorts of things, fiction and nonfiction. Uh, he was uh, he was heavily influenced by uh, uh, Anthony Hope's big hit novel from 1894, *The Prisoner of Zenda*. It's kind of a fantasy novel, and uh, Nicholson wanted to set an adventure fantasy. He thought he could do it a little more locally. It didn't have to be set in some fictional faraway land. That was kind of his vision, and he thought about using Notre Dame as a setting for his novel, uh, but he stayed in the wintertime at, uh, at this house, which was part of the Vonnegut family. The Vonnegut family had, as you probably know, quite a number of cottages on the lake during this period, and this is one of them. Uh, today's address, some of these addresses switched around, but I think it was still the same back then, 762 East Shore Drive. 
And I just threw this in because it's a nice, it's a nice letter that kind of sums up. He wrote this for the, uh, the high, Culver High School Annual, as you see, in 1930, so long after the book was published in 1905. Um, I'm often asked how I came to write the book. The idea struck me on a visit to Lake Max and Cucky. It was a time when many stories were being written about imaginary kingdoms in Europe, following upon the great success of Anthony Hope's Prisoner of Zenda. I was struck with the idea of doing the same sort of yarn with an American setting. It wasn't necessary to have kings and princesses, and I set myself to weaving a romance about the lake. The towers of the academy uh, wore a sufficiently medieval air. And they, they do make a pretty strong, it's a pretty strong presence in the book. <coughs> Whoa. In the book. <laughs> Puberty, sorry. And I, I, used, I used winter scenes to create the necessary isolation. Of course, I changed the academy into a girl's school, which he did, an Episcopal girl's school, and took other liberties with the landscape. Once, I, once started, I had a lot of fun in the writing. I began in October and finished in April. And as that was a very snowy winter, some snow naturally got into the tail. Uh, and if you read the book, and I think it's a really enjoyable book. I know I don't know if somebody age 16 would, would enjoy it, but maybe I just liked it because, you know, I, I recognize the place. But here we are, The House of a Thousand Candles. It's published in, uh, in 1905, as I said, by Bob Merrill of Indianapolis. Uh, it went on to wild success, becoming, this is great, the best-selling novel of 1906 in the entire United States. I mean, to take that in, you know, the best-selling novel in the United States. I mean, you know, it was big enough that advertise, advertising campaigns and slogans, political slogans, I mean, they developed around this House of a Thousand Candles theme, you know, using different variations on it. I mean, it just became a household term, the House of a Thousand Candles. It inspired uh, at least one stage play. And I've read three Hollywood movie versions. I, there's a, the second one. It is three. Yeah. The, the latest one doesn't have the last one, which is, I think, the only one you can still find, I think. Uh, it, it has very little to do with the book. I'm told the first one, well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. <laughs> the earliest version uh, was also, the, I believe, the earliest version was the closest uh, to the plot of the novel. It was a 1915 silent movie from, uh, I may mispronounce this, Selig Polyscope. Uh, company. Um, and, and what we're seeing here, the only, well, I'll show you a few of the only known photos. There was a, a movie edition of the book published at the time of the movie, and, and actually we have it here in the collection, and, and the only, the only, that's all we have left. A lot of the old silent films, unless they were transferred to safety film, they were nitrate, and they self, sort of self-destructed. So it may be it was transferred, it could be sitting in somebody's vault somewhere, and we'll someday find it, but as of now it's officially listed as lost which is kind of a shame. Here's a few more photos. No, no they didn't film it around here. You know, they, they recreated the aura of the house. Flip my notes over. I found these in the Culver Academy of Vedette. I won't read all the text, but in 1922, I do like this. If you were to journey to Max and Cucky some moonlight night, you would pass on your way a house that looks barren enough in broad daylight. But under the shimmering rays of the moon, it appears as forbidding and gloomy as any abode could be. I don't know how Creighton stands it. Uh, <laughs> from, I don't know where they get that, because it's, you know, whatever. But from, from every window could be seen rogue ghosts with phosphorus scepters. Or could, or could that be merely the reflection of the window pane of the green gold moon which hung so high above? Your mind would make witches' cries of every wind that whistled through the tops of the stately oaks. You get the idea. Uh, so then they go on to talk about Meredith Nicholson and the ghostly environment uh, is, is the result of the, you know, the House of a Thousand Candles. Um, and they do kind of tout the Academy being centrally featured as, as you would expect them to. Um, here's Meredith Nicholson visiting in October of 1920. Um, and they go on about that and, and, and his talks. Spoke very briefly to the English class. He also reviewed the parade at the Academy in 1920. I mean, a lot of these guys did this stuff. I just happened to find these articles. And there he is in May of 1925. And he's, next to him is George Ade, who is another huge Golden Age author. Uh, I mean, he doesn't have nearly the direct connection to Lake Mexicucky, at least that I, not that I was able to uncover, as the others do. But here he is at the Academy uh, for, uh, I think it was the literary society event that they had there at the time, if I remember the context of that. At any rate, the house itself was uh, preserved as a historic landmark, I'm sorry, was presented a historic landmark award in May 1984 by the Marshall County Historical Society, um, believed to have been built in 1881. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that because I'm probably going to mess something up, so I won't do that. Um, and this is kind of fun. Um, again, Meredith Nicholson did you know, he, his love for the lake shows. In, in 1912, he wrote a novel called The Hoosier Chronicle. And I think you know, the contents of this little excerpt I'm going to read kind of, again, give you some insight into why Lake Max and Cucky meant so much to some of these folks. Um, particularly if they were coming from Indianapolis on south. And we don't think about this much, but again, there's a, the main character is a young girl named Sylvia. There's a chapter in, in the Hoosier Chronicle called Sylvia at Lake Wapagan. I may be probably mispronouncing that. Uh, but but he's, it's Lake Max and Cucky. I mean, he's using a pseudonym for Lake Max and Cucky. And he describes the reaction of this young girl from southern Indiana visiting the lake. The key here is that southern Indiana, as you may or may not know, has no natural lakes of any size at all. Now they do because they've created these reservoirs and they have these huge lakes bigger than ours, but they're all man-made. Um, so all she's really got, well, I'll just read the excerpt here in a moment. Soon they embarked and crossing the lake, which seemed to Sylvia a vast, and were crossing the lake, which seemed to Sylvia a vast ocean. Twilight was enfolding the world and all manner of fairy lights began to twinkle at the far edges of the water and on the dark heights above the lake. Overhead, the stars were slipping into their wanted places. You can get an idea of how it is at sea, said her grandfather, smiling at her long upward gaze, only you can hardly feel the wonder of it all here or the great loneliness of the ocean at night. It was, however, wonder enough for a girl who had previously looked upon no more impressive waters than those of Fall Creek, Sugar Creek, and White River. <laughs> now, we're talking about the cultural golden age, and, and those really, what I've just described, are really the authors, if we want to be proper of that period, but, you know, and, and the person you see in this picture is a, is a generation removed, really, from those novelists. If you think about Tarkington publishing his novel, his first novel in 1890, well, here, Cole Porter was born in 1891, and he's, of course, not a, a, a novelist, uh, so, you know, he's a, he's a generation off, but we can still count him, because he really became very famous before 1920. He was born in Peru, as we know, Peru, Indiana, in a, the country, um, and of course he's the great American composer and songwriter, or a great American composer and songwriter. Um, and here's a quote. To get away from the deep heat and dust of the town, that is Peru, in midsummer, almost everyone had an aunt or uncle to visit on a farm. Cole didn't have to worry about that, for he had farms enough of his very own. But the most fortunate went away to the lakes. To the Shirks and Edwards, the Coles and the Helms of, and our family, the lakes meant Lake Max and Cucky. Uh, and, and that's a quote from his friend, uh, Cole Porter's childhood friend, Tommy Hendricks. Down here, there's Cole on the, what is that, the right. <laughs> um, as a boy at Lake Max and Cucky, that's taken at the lake. Hendricks, again, was a boyhood friend of Porter's. He went on to become a sports writer and broadcaster, as well as secretary of the Indiana State Medical Association and a World War I veteran. Again, a Lake Max and Cucky picture of the Hendricks family. Uh, Tommy there is inset in his World War I uniform. And he is significant, Tom the Hendricks is, because he, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. He wrote a memoir of his boyhood with Cole Porter. But as the story goes, Cole spent many boyhood summers in what is today the Bramfeld Cottage at 1322 East Shore Drive. That's it. It's the yellow house today. Uh, it was built in or about 1900, as far as we know, by Milton Shirk. It was one of the largest houses on the lake, designed in the Swiss chalet style, which is a subtype of the craftsman style of the early 20th century. And of the many celebrities on the lake, Cole Porter's time here is one of the best documented. Hendricks wrote a manuscript around 1944 that he intended to be a book, I don't believe it was ever published as a book, about his childhood with Cole had a very detailed account of, I mean, chapter and chapter about their time on Lake Max and Cucky. And here's a quote. Cole and I spent many happy summer days at Max and Cucky. Hundreds of the turtles we netted, thousands of the shiners we seined. All day we spent on or near its waters. The big time for us, of course, outside of meals came each afternoon while we were in bathing when the big lake steamer, the Peerless, docked. Here's the Peerless. It's docked in this picture down by the Antiquarian Lighthouse there at the Vandalia Park. When White Cap spotted the lake, Captain Crook, who was the captain of the Peerless, would shake his head and say, boys, it's a rough ocean today. You better not come aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Hendricks goes on to tell of Cole Porter in his wet bathing suit scrambling onto the Peerless's piano seat. They had a piano on the boat, at least for a while, to tinkle away at the keys and escaping as the out-of-breath old captain tried in vain to catch him. However, a few years later, Cole was invited to play on the steamer by to play piano on the steamer by Captain Crook, who had become his greatest admirer. 
Here he's Captain Crook. When that kid plays the piano, every, everyone rides on the steamer just like it. Don't cost them 10 cents an hour. <laughs> but they don't look at the scenery no longer. They just listen to him play and sing. At least they call it singing. But to me, it ain't no more than just talking to music. <laughs> uh, we have some of that now, right? At least some people opinion, but some of the songs are awfully funny and sometimes awfully pretty. <laughs> um, as time went on for the boys, Cole and, and Tommy Hendricks, Cole Porter and Tommy Hendricks, uh, Cole was sent east to prep school. They spent their summers together still at the lake, but their interest in turtles was soon replaced by an interest in girls. At least as Hendricks writes. That wasn't exactly true for Cole, but we won't get into that. Um, <laughs> In the daytime, writes Hendricks, he could compete with Cole in many activities, but at night the girls asked for song after song from Cole. He writes, Cole ran through the whole field of popular songs, starting with the song hits of the current season and working back to Gilbert and Sullivan and sometimes to the old English ballad drinking songs. As he played, he had to get his rhythm paced so as to compete with the pounding and throbbing of the engine. Thus, he played steadily from the time we left the academy pier until we circled the lake and landed at our home dock, often at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, unconsciously, Cole learned to accommodate his piano playing to the steady, lunging rhythm of the peerless. Plenty has been written about the unusual timing of Cole Porter's tunes, but there isn't anything unusual or mysterious about them at all uh, to we who heard Cole play on the old peerless piano. Critics may say Cole's music was influenced by the New York traffic, uh, the New York traffic war, or by the ballet of the, of the opera in Paris, but don't forget that night after night, summer after summer, Cole hammered out his rhythm by the tempo which that master Captain Crook set for the peerless engine. <laughs> Jumping ahead. So there we go. Cole Porter's music really came from Lake Max and Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Jumping ahead. Of course, you know, we're well past the golden age as we look at Kurt Vonnegut here. Uh, many of you sat in this room about three years ago for a similar presentation on Kurt Vonnegut and the Vonnegut families of Lake Max and Kentucky. Uh, while famous, hugely popular uh, novelist Kurt may not, I'm sorry, while famous, hugely popular novelist Kurt may not have been part of that golden age, his family on Lake Max and Kentucky certainly helped uh, formulate an atmosphere that revered and treasured culture and arts, as I mentioned earlier. And the late Kurt Vonnegut, Jr., actually, was very vocal in his love of Lake Max and Kentucky and his influence on it. And that little advertisement, of course, is the Vonnegut Orchards on East Shore Drive, which now at least part of that land was Dr. Reese's. Um, I won't review Kurt's career here or go back into you know, the, the contents of that presentation, uh, although his literary merit certainly places him in the same category as the Golden Age authors. I mean, he's considered one of the great writers of the 20th century, uh, as, as does his love of the lake. He was really, really did love Lake Max and Cookie. But I do just want to pause for a moment and, uh, and, and acknowledge his cousin, Katie Catherine Rasmussen of the East Shore. She was a big help. Uh, to me in, in putting together that presentation three years ago and she passed away in January, which is a loss to everyone. And I think, again, even though we're out of the golden age with Kurt, some of his words are worth repeating. Uh, in, a, in a letter to his cousin Katie, who we just saw, he wrote of Lake Max and Cucky, that will always be an enchanted body of water to me, by Aegean Sea, perfect in every dimension. Its shores, he wrote, in, a, in another context, in an article, for Architectural Digest magazine, its shores are a closed loop. No matter where I was on its circumference, all I had to do was keep walking in one direction to find my way home again. No matter where I am, and even if I have no clear idea where I am, and no matter how much trouble I may be in, I can achieve a blank and shining serenity if only I can reach the very edge of a natural body of water. The very edge of anything from a rivulet to an ocean says to me, now you know where you are, now you know which way to go, you'll soon be home. Any questions? Yeah. Or insults or anything? You are so good, Jeff. You're amazing. You know, this, uh, what we're doing in the museum is uh, is featuring the golden age of, uh, of Lake Max and Cucky and, uh, and certainly the Indiana authors that are in there now. But we have to always remember that this was 
uh, this was a golden age of not only the lake, but also the town. We had these fabulous hotels. We had the, uh, uh, the steamboat industry, the railroads. And at the same time, it, uh, uh, the academy came in during this period of what we call the golden age. And it's, it's very important that we bring that, well, those three elements together in an image of this area. Because all three of them are very important. Obviously, this has national uh, attraction. But what we're featuring in that museum is the, is the town, the growth of the town, the people of the town. At one time, the State Exchange Bank was the third largest bank in Indiana. Uh, they had an operating account from IBM, uh, which uh, it, was, uh, it was a golden era. And what we're trying to do in the museum is to feature all three of those components and bring them into one image. Because uh, it's very important to have people come to our area, the, the tourists, the vacationers, the, and uh, make investments in our town. So we think that uh, the Antiquarian Society is, is giving a gift to the town. We, you know, we, we own the park. Well, you just heard the... Uh, uh, treasurer's report. That, that park costs us about $4,000 a year to maintain. Uh, the museum is going to cost us even more. But it's a gift that we want to give to the town, to the area. And uh, I think it's, it's very important that, uh, that we do that. Uh, so again, we appreciate you coming. I hope that you'll come in, go into the museum the, uh, and see, uh, I'm anxious to see uh, uh, Creighton's uh, handiwork in there. So, uh, and uh, again, we'll be having more presentations. We need your help with uh, volunteers. If you can volunteer uh, to come into the museum and be a docent uh, or uh, on the, uh, uh, the Taste of Culver, please do. Please, we need volunteers. We have to operate as a volunteer organization. So, if we need all the help we can get.